Pleasant. It's good to be uh, here with you again on this Wednesday night. And as you know, we've been going through the Psalms uh, on our Wednesday nights and using those as our sort of our prayer guide. Uh, last week we were in Psalm 22, and, and that's such a great psalm. Uh, in it, uh, David discusses uh, his his sufferings. We see his sufferings, and we see uh, how he was he came through those with the, certainly with the Lord's help. Uh, and we saw really the glory that came after that uh, for David. But we talked. Uh, most importantly, about how that pointed uh, to Christ, how David's sufferings were exemplified in Christ, and 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 that led to uh, Christ's um, subsequent glory as well. And both of these were very personal in nature, both of David, David's sufferings and Christ. But when we are moved into that realm of glory and and what comes because of the suffering uh, this sort of opens up the audience opened up into this uh, communal uh, aspect where uh, David and his subsequent glory after his sufferings uh, was really uh, for all of Israel and then we saw that for Christ his sufferings and his, his, his death his resurrection his ascension uh, this really opened up uh, uh, this uh, this possibility of salvation uh, for all nations. And it's truly it's truly a magnificent psalm. And uh, Alec Maltair uh, writes this about it. He says Psalm 22 is such holy ground that we take off our shoes and walk with uh, careful, even hesitant steps. He writes when coming face to face with it, we marvel as well as tremble. And the magnificence of this psalm ending in such glory sets us up then for what we see in Psalm 23. What we see is that water, or rather who, uh, seems at once unapproachable in glory. It is viewed here in this next song as anything but unapproachable. So we have in Psalm 22 the Lord who, who suffered for us, the risen and exalted one, who then uh, in the next breath we have three different images of that same Lord, one who is not unapproachable, but one who is at the same time our shepherd, our companion, and our host. And what we see as we go through Psalm 23 is that the imagery, uh, it becomes more intimate. It's progressively more intimate. And the relationship in view uh, is certainly more intimate, but this relationship is not only one in the present, but it also has future implications as well. So as typical for us on Wednesday nights, we're going to go through this psalm. We're not going to dwell in each each verse very long, um, but I want to I want us to go through it. I want us to see how it, how it maybe applies uh, to our life, and then how, most importantly, given what we're doing on these Wednesday nights, how we should pray in light of it, how this should, how this should guide our, uh, our relationship uh, with the Father and our, our speaking to Him, our conversating with Him, our, uh, our relationship. So uh, certainly we'll go through the psalm and we'll see how we relate uh, to God in light of it. So first, uh, we'll read the first three verses of Psalm 23, and the image we have here is the Lord as our shepherd. We see it in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So the first image we have here uh, of the Lord is that of a shepherd, and, and this would come as no this this was not something that David would be unfamiliar with, given uh, his prior occupation as a shepherd himself. So he is uniquely qualified to be able to write uh, something like this. But he starts out then with this with his metaphor describing uh, the Lord as a shepherd, and this is really the first time. Uh, in the whole Psalter, where uh, the Lord is described as something so intimate, uh, we've we've seen Him already in the Psalter described as uh, things like a rock, uh, a shield, and, and certainly these describe uh, the Lord well. But 
but a rock or a shield or, or these inanimate objects are, are not very intimate. Whereas this idea of a shepherd uh, is, it is intimate. It, it speaks to someone, uh, as Derek Kidner writes, who thinks and observes in terms of his flock. And the flock itself then is totally, uh, totally reliant upon him. Uh, we see, we just know from our own experience, our own understanding of a shepherd, that the shepherd uh, leads his sheep. He, he gathers them. He protects them. He, he provides for them. He cares uh, for them. So, so he leads, certainly. We see, we see that the shepherd leads and he provides. David says, I shall not want. But what else? Where does he, where does he lead? What is this? What is this 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 shepherd leadership this this guidance? Uh, where is it towards? We see that he maketh me lie down in green pastures. Uh, he leadeth me beside the still waters. So he's leading then to these these good places. Each of these scenes speak of of a good place, a safe place, a place of rest, a place of restoration, a place where the sheep are not. Uh, in danger. And it's no surprise then that David uh, could come in the next verse and say, he restores my soul. He, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So certainly uh, he leads them uh, into these safe places, into these places of rest, into these places where things like restoration can be uh, possible. So we see this restoration, this idea of he restores my soul. Restoration can certainly be physical in, in that in that you need you need rest in order if I, if I go out on a on a run, if I go out on a five mile run, if I make it back alive, uh, I'm gonna need rest, right? I, I'm gonna I'm, I'm not gonna be able to go out and do uh, the next day probably what I did before. I need rest, I need recovery from that. From that physical uh, activity that that took place, but but restoration here, most importantly, it, it's what is in view is a spiritual uh, restoration, a spiritual restoration where he, uh, the Lord, is restoring uh, David's soul, and we need that just as much as physical physical restoration, right? Where we may go through something in life, we may go through a hard time, we may go through uh, just something that we've never experienced before uh, that's really been taxing on not just our body but but our mind been taxing on us uh, spiritually and, and we need that we need that restoration and, and what we see here is David saying that the Lord leads him uh, into these these green pastures beside these still waters. And it's there that David does not have to worry about provision. He doesn't have to worry about providing for himself. He doesn't have to worry about fending things off. Rather, he, he, he is there with the shepherd, and the shepherd uh, restores his soul. And he leads him then, not on these wrong paths, but on the path of righteousness. And this speaks to the nature of the shepherd's leadership. He leads him down the right path paths. Now, this doesn't mean, and what we're going to see in verse 4, it doesn't mean that that the paths are always uh, easy. It doesn't mean that the paths are always going to be in green pastures and beside still waters. But regardless of how hard the path at times may be, we can be sure that the shepherd leads us down the right paths, the paths of, of righteousness. And why does he do this? He does this primarily for his, certainly for us as a sheep, but for his name's sake. So the, the flock then represents the shepherd's name. A shepherd could then, should then be able to proudly say, this, this is my flock. It's like a mother or a father uh, should be proud to say, this is my child. And our, us children should represent our parents well. It could be said of a coach and his team, a coach, should be able to stand up in the middle or end of a season and say, this, this is my team. I'm presenting to you my team. A lot of times, uh, I, you know, I'm a Duke fan. 
so uh, I'm a big Coach K fan as well. Well, they do a, a thing at the beginning of the season before any games happen where they bring out uh, they bring out uh, the team and they present them to the fans, to the Cameron Crazies. And this, this is a way of saying, this is my team. This is, this is who is going to go forth uh, this season and represent, uh, certainly Coach K, but represent Duke. So the, the same is true uh, for, I don't know, a teacher in her classroom. Teachers take great pride uh, in, their, in their class. They protect, right, a, a teacher is going to, uh, protect her students. A teacher is going to say, uh, you know, these are my kids, right? And the classroom should hopefully represent uh, that teacher well. So we we understand this this idea from a very practical perspective, and this is what this is what David is saying here that that the flock represents the shepherd, and, and these things go together. Uh, Kidner, in his commentary, again, he writes this. He says, God would not have taken on a flock or a family if he had not intended that he and they should be bound up with one another. It's such a comforting, such a comforting feeling, right? It's such a comforting truth that we are bound up uh, with our Father. We are bound up with God, that we are one, we are his family. He he is he calls us his family and we can proudly call him our father. So we see David here with this first uh, intimate understanding of of uh, the Lord as my shepherd. And then he goes even more intimate and we're going to see in verse 4 the Lord as his companion. Now the shepherd imagery in a way continues uh, but what we see is that the address in verse 4 uh, changes. David goes from talking about God, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me, he leads me, he restores me, he leads me. He, instead of speaking or talking about God, in verse 4, he begins to talk to God. He goes from he to you. We see, yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are Thou art with me. You are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. So we see this shift. Uh, it, it signifies to us uh, no longer the symbolism of a shepherd that goes ahead, that leads from the front, but now we have this language of a companion or a friend who is who is dropped back, who is who has come alongside of you and is going to walk in that side-by-side -side, uh, companionship, that side-by-side -side path uh, with you, and this is a good thing. Uh, certainly, if you've if you've ever you've ever walked through something in your spiritual life, if, um, certainly you have. If there's been difficult times, uh, it's nice to have someone side by side. It's nice to have a companion. Uh, I think I think when I when I struggle with uh, pastoral issues, uh, whatever it may be, uh, I know right off of a handful of pastors and friends who I can call, who I can call or text, and and I can talk with them because, because we walk alongside, uh, we walk alongside of one another, we, we have the same experiences, we, we, we help one another uh, in this. Now, this is not so much side-by-side -side companionship as, as if we help as we help God, of course, there's some breakdown in that illustration. But what we see certainly is this idea of companionship. We see the Lord coming by as a friend, as a as a companion, and now walking with the psalmist through whatever it is that he's going through. Now, certainly, we don't help the Lord. He he's the he is he is a hundred percent the the helping companion here. Uh, but what we're gonna see. Is that this is a good thing? This is certainly a good thing uh, because the pastures now they're they're not green any longer. Uh, the waters are no longer still. Uh, what is ahead now? David says is the valley of the shadow of death. You know, we see in in uh, verse four, and we see in the second part of verse four, I will fear no evil. So apparently, there's evil uh, nearby. As well, but in the midst of that, uh, the valley of the shadow of death, in the midst of evil, David says, I, "I will fear not." 
And why can he say this? Because he has that companionship with the Lord by his side. It says, I will not fear. I will fear no evil because you are with me. Again, we see this idea of companionship. It's nice to not have to go through things alone. We have the Lord who walks by our side. And he goes further and he says, your rod and, and your staff, they comfort me. So the companion, the shepherd is, is also armed. We see the rod uh, used for defense and we see the staff used uh, for control. So, so not only will he defend against the enemies coming forward, but he will also control us in the sense that he will, he will guide us down uh, the righteous path, even in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, so why then can we trust the Lord as our companion, even in the face of evil, even in the face of, of death? Kidner writes this. He says, only the Lord can lead a man through death. All other guides turn back and the traveled must go alone. Why can we, why can we trust that the Lord can lead us through these times? Well, he is one who ex has experienced death, right? He is one who has experienced death and who beat it. Uh, and certainly uh, he can walk through it. If he can, if he can beat that, he can certainly walk through it uh, with you and with me. And what we see here, what we, what we're continually seeing in this psalm is this increasing intimacy, right? The Lord was and the Lord is David's shepherd and, and leading ahead but the Lord is equally his companion, uh, his, his friend, walking by his side. And now as we move into this, this final image, uh, we see the Lord as a host and we as his guest. We read it uh, in verses 5 through 6. Let me finish for, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Verse 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So David shifts from this imagery of shepherd and, and sheep to that of uh, companionship to that of friendship, of, of, of a familial uh, relationship of, of God and his us being his guests at his table. So we see that out of the valley of the shadow of death comes this prepared table in the presence of David's enemies. Now, we don't know if, if David is speaking here uh, of a feast in which the enemies are present uh, as, as captives or or whatever it may be, but the, but the point remains that the threat, whatever that may be, there in the, the evil in the valley of the shadow of death, that threat now is seen to be over, right? The table is prepared, the oil is there for anointing, the cup overflows. In other words, what David is saying is that everything that is needed uh, for this table, for this, this, this victory celebration is present. And that's what this is. It's a, it's a victory celebration, one that, one that David would partake in and one that we get to partake in. Moreover, it's not just a victory celebration. It's, it's also a covenant meal, a covenant meal that, that creates a, a bond between the one that serves and the one that receives, between the host and the guest. Uh, the meal also it, it resembles this, this covenant relationship between God and Israel in the Old Testament, uh, and then the New Covenant in the New Testament at the Last Supper. So we see these images here uh, as well. And what, what we see in this is more than just a, a mutual gathering. It's more than just something that occurs occasionally. It's more than just a victory feast uh, here in the present. Uh, what we see here is, is familial. Uh, and, and that this is a family gathering, it's a family relationship, but also it, it's final, it's final, uh, it's, it's sure. Uh, this relationship, this, this family relationship is seen in, in the expression goodness and mercy. Kidner writes that these words together suggest uh, the, the, kind of, the, the kindness and support that one can count on in the family or between firm 
friends. So what this is, this type of love and, and relationship, it represents the constant pursuit that God has for us, the constant love, the constant faithfulness that He has for us all the days of our life. And it doesn't just speak to our life here and now. This this follows us into eternity, where, where this family will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So not only do we see this, this continued uh, intimacy, this increasing intimacy, this progressive intimacy for hosts and, and guests, that relationship is the most intimate. But also what we see is this increasing, even infinite time frame. Uh, he is shepherd, he is companion, he is host, not just now, uh, but certainly forever. And I just, I want to conclude uh, as we come to the close of this by just looking at a few passages in the New Testament uh, that show the same God of the Old Testament is the eternal Lord of the New Testament. And here we see him as, uh, here in the New Testament, we see him as the Good Shepherd. Uh, we see it uh, certainly in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Certainly, uh, we see it as well in Hebrews. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. And we see him as one whose glory doesn't fade. We see this in First Peter uh, chapter number five, and when the sh when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And finally, we we see in Revelation seven seventeen that this shepherd leads us to the living water. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, and God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. What what a shepherd! Uh, we have what a companion uh, we have what a host uh, we have and, and again it's not just in this life it's 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 leading to this eternal life where we will continually follow uh, the good shepherd where he will continually lead us to the fountains of living water these images which which are true they're not simply images they're, they're true should inform the way, uh, specifically the way we pray, uh, given what we do on these Wednesday nights. This should inform certainly the way that we live, but also the way in which we relate uh, to our God. We don't have to, what we see is that we don't have to make the way, we don't have to clear the path, we don't have to grasp blindly, we don't have to use a map. We have a shepherd that leads, uh, he, and he leads towards the path of righteousness and spiritual renewal. Moreover, when there's no green pastures, when there are no still waters, when evil and death seem near, he's also a companion. He's a friend. He's he's one who protects, who controls, who doesn't leave our side. And finally, in this life and in the next, he's our host. He is faithful. His covenant is sure. We are his family now and forever. And that's the kind, this is the kind of confidence uh, that we should uh, we should pray in. We should pray with the assurance of his leadership. We should pray with the assurance of his companionship and pray with the assurance of his faithfulness. What we should ultimately do is pray intimately, right? This this psalm progressively leads, uh, progressively lends itself to this increasing intimacy, he goes before us, he walks beside us, and he reclines at the table with us. And, and that's what I want us to understand tonight as we pray. As you pray with your family, as you pray alone, whatever it may be, take a few minutes. It's a short psalm. Meditate on the psalm and then pray through it. Pray through it. Make it personal. Make it personal uh, for you. So you do that however, however, you, however you feel best. Um, but meditate on this psalm, make it personal, uh, and pray through it. So let me let me lead us in a prayer, uh, and then then take a few minutes uh, to pray through this yourself, Father. 
Thank you for this song. Thank you for what we see in it. That the same God who suffered and died, the same God who was resurrected and ascended to the highest possible place, is now our shepherd who who leads us to green pastures, who leads us to still waters, who restores our soul. Father, thank you that you are also our companion, that when the pastures are not green, when the waters are not still, when death and evil seem to be all around, you are with us, you are by our side. Your rod, your staff, your protection, your control, they comfort. And Father, we thank you that you have prepared the table for us. Not only are you our shepherd and our companion, but our host, and we are your guests. We thank you for the victory. That has been won in Christ Jesus. And what that means for our lives moving forward. That we are in the family. And that we get to experience that here and now. But certainly for all eternity. And we thank you for that. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.